on this week's edition of InCycle, we chart the rise of the Israel Cycling Academy to the World Tour. Every year we have been stepping up the game a little bit. Um, and the same thing we have asked from all the riders to do the same thing, and especially the Israelis. There's a look at how Radio Tour keeps everybody in the know during races. We get into the race, we give the gap time, we say in case of a breakaway, who are the rider in the breakaway. But first, we take a trip down memory lane with NTT's Michael Valgren. It's like, hi, I'm Michael Valgren, rider for Tinkoff Saxo. This is my NeoPro diary for InCycle or just... No, you can just say this is my NeoPro diary. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just now? Whenever, yeah. Okay. <laughs> hi, I'm Michael. Now, <laughs> I'm getting nervous, you know, now I have a line. That's not good. That's why I didn't become an actor. <laughs> Ever since his days as a neo-pro, InCycle have been following Michael Valgren's career closely. Six years later, and with the Dane established as one of the best classics riders in the world, we met with the NTT rider to discuss his rise to stardom, including his big breakthrough victory at the 2018 Omlop at Newsblad. To win the Omlop was like unbelievable, to be honest, like it's opening weekend, you know, I, I maybe didn't realize myself how big it was to win the opening weekend in, in Belgium, you know, the home of cycling and, and, and the fans and ever since I hear people, you know, yell my name, oh, that's the winner from the Omlop, you know, that's just, uh, that's super cool. For sure that, uh, that race, that changed my, my career, like also my mindset that now I want to be the best in the classics. I want to show people that uh, I'm a classic driver. Left hand side for us tonight's Michael Valgren and Anderson to go. Valgren the Dane, the winner of Omlop at Newsblad, and he has so much power. He has time to celebrate. It's Michael Valgren for Astana who wins at the Amstel Gold Race. 2018, I think I was just like kind of walking on the walking on water. Like I, whatever I did was was the right decision, so... Because maybe I wasn't in such a good shape in, uh, in Omlop, actually. But then I kind of built it up towards, uh, towards Anthony Gore as, uh, as I won, like being fourth in, in Tour of Flanders, so... I think that year, uh, without knowing what I actually did, I just did everything right. Where some years, you, whatever reason or like decision you, you take is maybe the wrong one, you know, though you think it's the right one. Uh, so some years, I think it's just like, just like that. 2019 ultimately proved to be one of those difficult seasons for the 28-year-old, following a move to the team now known as NTT Pro Cycling. And with his old Tinkoff Saxo manager and compatriot Bjarne Rees in charge, the Dane is looking forward to a bright future with the squad. Bjarne Rees joining the team is uh, it's, it's pretty exciting, you know, me being a Dane and, and, and no Bjarne from, from the past, so... Uh, even though we didn't work together that, that much, we still kept in touch uh, after. I think Bjarne, he saw, or maybe still see, like some kind of star in me, and that's why we, we kept texting each other. So it's, it's, it's super nice to have him on, him on board and, and that he will work with me. So I think we can, I think we can make some good, uh, good things happen. Bjarne, he... He likes to watch people and, and like now when we were training he, he really observed and and one day he came to me and in the car he's he used to sit like this in the car and look and then he's like why do you come here? And he tells me, You look really great. It's like oh you know that's that's big words from Bjarne. So already there I think it's um, it's a big step forward already in, 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 in twenty twenty. And then if you could just press play in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> oh heck. I know I still look young but now when I see these pictures I look even younger. So no I changed a lot like uh, my mentality and in, in, in just the whole um, lifestyle about being professional I think back in these days I was 
I like my bike, but it's not like now, where now actually I love, I love my bike. Um, I cannot imagine without a day without training or anything. It's funny to see my girlfriend or uh, yeah, wife. I think it's good that uh, sometimes during a race I have got my kicked, so I don't think I'm Superman right away and I have to, to work for it. My mind is clear now that uh, I have to work 100% all the time to be in the, with the best, and if not, then yeah, forget about it. I think back then I was still so young and not, I'm not so good in like the history of cycling or the races, so I'm not even sure back then I knew what Omelette was, to be honest. <laughs> um, but like, just to win in, in, in the highest level was not something I was thinking back of then, back then because I was still so young and, and, and new to this. So I'm, 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 I'm super happy and super privileged to, to, to be here today because how many professionals are we out there? Maybe five, six hundred on the world tour. It's not a lot of people compared to how many there actually is on the bike. So I'm happy to be, to be here. We have now one minute, one minute to the leading riders. A mechanical for the GC leader. Once again, it's the blue jersey. How many times has this happened to Geraint Thomas in the past? So it's Landa Meana rider 101 from Movistar team who claims the victory. <laughs> The excitement of an unpredictable race is what makes the sport of cycling so popular. While viewers at home can fully immerse themselves in the spectacle, teams, media and race organisers are looking for facts and clarity. I work at the, with the, the Radio Tour staff, but in fact in Italy we call it Radio Informazione, so let me call it Radio Info. We are giving... Uh, information to all the convoy and other listeners too as to how the stage is developing ultimo chilometro per l'andamiana maica aru e hermans it's a live feed and we're saying what's happening from the very start of the stage till the finish stage number four has officially started i work in the car with uh, an Italian speaker and I'm the English-French speaker. We have two colleagues uh, on the motorbikes feeding us uh, with uh, live information throughout the race. And two other colleagues are at the finish line and two people are at the radio repeater, usually placed on a high mountain or hill or so. Bennett number 161 is counter-attacking. We get into the race, we give the gap time, we say in case of a breakaway who are the rider in the breakaway, in case of uh, counter-attackers we're saying when the counter-attack uh, takes place and who are the riders who are counter-attacking. This uh, sort of information are broadcasted from our car to all the people who listen to us. And we'll then use this information in different ways, of course. 53 seconds down as an attack goes now from Mikel Landa. Landa is a GC player at a big danger. Race Radio is, is one of the, the sources of information that we use to, to then get our, our commentary across to the, the public. Lopez Moreno in difficulty. Oh, oh Lopez, Lopez just got to a grinding halt. I don't know if that's a mechanical or a body failure. And so if and when a brake goes up the road, it's, it's trying to write down numbers while also trying to commentate um, and watch the pictures as well. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot of things going on. 
radio tour is important to get uh, all the information uh, from the time gaps, uh, from some uh, dangerous situations in the road. We had the last days also some uh, cars on the road uh, or uh, some emergencies that uh, is very dangerous for the rider. The gap goes down 3.15. It's in my eyes uh, the easiest way and uh, we use that uh, many years and it works very well and uh, for me it's uh, not only that we give information, it's also a, a security for the riders and uh, when some rider crashed or have a puncture, also that information go much, much faster to the car and uh, in my eyes uh, it's a very important point. We can uh, bring things into commentary which which you wouldn't necessarily see on on the pictures. So often we will, you know, you might hear that uh, a certain rider has, has had a crash or a puncture. So if, for instance, it's um, it's a mechanical on the run in um, towards a, a sprint finish or on the climb, as as we had uh, Geraint Thomas a couple of days ago. Once again, it's the blue jersey, the race leader Geraint Thomas. Misfortune for him. How many times has this happened to Geraint Thomas in the past? On the one hand, there is the excitement. Every time you get in the car and the stage or the race starts, it's a, it's a great uh, adventure every time. But at the same time, you get very focused. The final 100 meters as they turn left hand and he's downhill. Malta at the front. Landa finds the little acceleration that breaks the challenge of Rafa Maika. So it's Landa Meana rider 101 from Movistar team who claims the victory. It's just to be the those guys who break the boundaries that we always thought it's impossible to break. We're a non-for-profit startup sports team started by a few crazy people who thought they can make it to the Tour de France. I brought Mauro Vigny, the director of the Giro. He laughed. I don't think he thought I was serious. Every year we have been stepping, uh, stepping up the game a little bit. I think the growing process of this team is, is insane. <laughs> the deal was signed on the last day before we had to put in the submission. Look at this now, we were one of the biggest teams in the world. This team uh, going to the highest level in the world, it, it gives the young generation the possibility to dream big. I feel very good! <laughs> The story of how Israel's startup nation made it to cycling's elite club began here and in the mind of one man back in 2015. So it was July, the TV was open, I saw the Tour de France and, and I decided I want to be there. Obviously there was no Israeli rider who ever raced the Tour de France. I realized quickly that I was simply not good enough. I lacked the talent and at the same time uh, I just didn't go through the same path that riders in my age, would have go through in other countries. The Israeli sport always missed the leap into the professional cycling. So no one ever really got there. No one really got the chance. No one really got the support that we have now in Cycling Academy. So I've got to, to go to Rand, sometimes our manager, and just say to him, Thank you, thank you for doing that, because without you, I wouldn't have this, this opportunity. We're a non-for-profit startup sports team, started by a few crazy people who thought they can, they can make it to the Tour de France uh, with people coming from countries like us. And I believe this sport has the opportunity to, to create a better society. I don't want to sound like a crazy, crazy person who tried to, to achieve world peace through that. But in my, in my own way, I feel that getting more people on the bike and getting more people on the bike in this country will help us change the, the reality that we see sometimes through the TV. One of the other ways to inspire them is, is just to be the, 
those guys who break the boundaries that we always thought it's impossible to break. Here I am at Pro Continental Ranks. Why shouldn't I go to Walter? I had started this project to build the velodrome here, so I guess some some people associated with the team um, uh, reached out to me uh, and asked me if I'd like the next time I come to Israel, would I like to go for a for a bike ride? So I did, and we started talking about the team, and um, they asked me to be on their board of directors. It was a continental team at the time. After some time. Um, I decided to make an investment in the team. And I was also uh, simultaneously in my early discussions with the Giro d'Italia about bringing the big start to Israel. Well, that was actually beyond my dreams because I was ringing me on, uh, to do a Grand Tour, but I would never imagine that my first Grand Tour will be starting in my home country. We were absolutely amazed and uh, shocked to, to see so many spectators coming out and uh, enjoying a wonderful sport event. I had an opportunity to meet Mauro Vegni, the director of the Giro, and uh, I suggested to him the idea of, of uh, doing the big start here in, here in uh, Israel. And we welcome Mauro Vegni, the director He laughed. Of the Giro. I don't think he thought I was serious. The Giro had never left Europe in its hundred years. He saw what everyone else sees when they come here. Uh, was surprised, impressed. For me, it was experience of a lifetime. It's really, uh, to start my first uh, Grand Tour in my home country was, yeah, was uh, unbelievable. And uh, I was so excited and I was so happy. You would have thought you were in Belgium or, or Holland or something. It was absolutely amazing. The best big start in, in the Giro's 101 year history right here in Israel. I've been uh, actually a few teams that have started up. First, I was in uh, Liquigas that restarted in 2005. Then I was in Sky that started in 2010. And then I was in IM Cycling that started in 2013. I really try to think about all the different uh, good things that were done in, in each of these teams um, and try to fit that into our team. I was determined uh, having been in the Pro Conti ranks, to move up uh, and to be able to, to secure sponsorship uh, in a more serious way and be, to, be, to be taken more credibly. It has been a little bit of an uh, ongoing uh, discussion with, uh, with teams about the, the possibility of, of uh, collaboration with somebody. And I probably met eight, nine, ten of the World Tour teams and talked to them about, you know, the possibility of uh, merging our enterprises. That was going on and off. So uh, there were highs and lows during the, the season where we were thinking one direction and then suddenly in another direction. Eventually, it, it, it worked with Katusha. The deal was signed on the last day before we had to put in a submission to the UCI for their license renewal. Literally the last day. Now they've reached World Tour level, Israel's startup nation haven't quite finished setting new aims and ambitions. Every year we have been stepping up the game a little bit. 
Um, and the same thing we have asked from all the riders to do the same thing, and especially the Israelis. I have to say I've been in this team from the first year, although not from the day, day one, but uh, from the first year. The growing process of this team is, is insane. Uh, we're just uh, stepping it up uh, slowly, slowly, and then it's, the big boom is coming again. So we are throwing in the, they throw us in the deepest water and they expect us to swim. We have guys that are capable of doing a grand tour, like, uh, like first uh, Guy Sagiv in, uh, in 2018, Giro, and then 2019, Guy Neve. And uh, yeah, now hopefully we are able to have Israelis also doing the same thing in the, in the, in the tour. We will have an Israeli rider ride in the Tour de France, which will be for us, a, for us as a nation historic. At the highest level, we are providing an opportunity for, for the best Israeli riders to reach the highest level of the sport and race in the biggest races. This team uh, going to the highest level in the world, it, it gives the young generation the possibility to dream big. It gives them the possibility to know that if they will work hard, if they will be determined enough, they will be able to get the opportunity to make it to the highest level. And I think it's, we're going to see much more uh, Israeli young riders trying to achieve it. <laughs> I think that now when we have the Conti team and the World team, it's the best combination to develop young Israelis. I feel very good! That's all this time. Until next week, keep up to date with us on social media.